as far as I remember, because it was a very long uh, process, but as far as I remember, the idea was to just have a sequence of what I called magic chords back then. I, and I set up this, this little algorithm that created just these three note harmonies, 513 three note harmonies. And uh, it was very fascinating because this particular sequence of harmonies uh, that I came up with at that point, which was just a, almost like a, a random thing, you know, it wasn't like designed to be exactly that sequence. But it was a very interesting sequence because it felt so totally ambiguous. Ambiguous and I, back then I described it as being gray, very gray, like, like a cardboard kind of gray um, that was totally also didn't have any, didn't give me lots of sensations. And, uh, and I think that that was the point where I was kind of felt myself challenged to turn this tasteless, to me tasteless, um, ab ambiguous progression of harmonies into something great. We're going to uh, see if we can print out an actual hard copy of the score for Marcus's piece. It's uh, a little bit more complicated than just showing up and pushing buttons on your printer or or you know photocopying stuff at the FedEx. If we print it on anything smaller than like about 17 by 22, um, the, the, the score, the notes and everything will be so small that they'll be illegible. I've had like better than 20-20 vision until I turned 50 yeah. <laughs> and then it started to go and a lot of a lot of orchestra scores are tiny tiny and really hard to read so a lot of times I take them and I blow them up to the bigger size. Marx's piece it's already so damn big you know we're not going to be able to explode it. It's actually great to have the, uh, the score because you, you can see how the parts are kind of canonic. You can see these shapes, and I will I will later explain why and how that is because mm -hmm. there are like seven themes, melodic themes in the piece, right. which are distributed across the whole orchestra. Yeah, it's, that's a good question. You know, I don't think anybody would, would want to write this out, but apparently okay. it got written out. <laughs> so, this looks really great. Except that this quartet is tr trilling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, I re yes, I remember. This is also something we, we filled in later. My nose gets really stuffy. I'll try to I'll be back in a minute. Yep. Movement seven? Yeah. It's a movement without um, without any harp and uh, vibes, right? Mm -hmm. I think we need to kind of think of an alternative if the gliss is too. I mean, obviously, a gliss is out of tune, but mm -hmm. I mean, if it kind of makes that initial pitch very, very unclear, we need to think of something else. I might as well try them to do a really wide vibrato mm -hmm. uh, instead. Or, you know, I mean, the thing that's important too is that is to play the pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, so that you really hear it yes. before doing the glissando. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's not like you can just, you know, slash and burn through there. You've got to really yes. be careful about it. Yeah. The, the challenge was to figure out from Marcus's initial information, which was orchestrated in a certain way, but not orchestrated like a standard symphony orchestra, was how to make that work. And, and I tried more conservative approaches at first, where it was the setup, and here's first violin, second violin, some violas, cellos, and sections. And I just got frustrated with it because I felt like I was having to move information around uh, within the score that was not appropriate, was not staying to Marcus's initial vision. So eventually, the non-traditional part of this, aside from the fact that there's a solo, every part is a soloist, is the fact that I have not followed the standard rules of orchestration. The standard rules of orchestration are for one brass instrument, you have to have two woodwind instruments to equal the volume. For that, you then have to have four string instruments playing the exact same part to equal that. Nope. We have one violin equals one tuba equals one English horn, you know, so it demands great sensitivity on the part of the players. Luckily, that doesn't mean reading the entire piece backwards, but I would like to start at the beginning of the eighth movement. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, over here to my uh, left is Mr. Marcus Reiter. So I just want to start by saying, this really is a reading session. Um, as you can tell by your setup at this point, um, things are not normal, <laughs> right? It's a little different. And the reason it's set up this way is because you are, as I said in the notes that I sent out to you, you are a member of a group, a small chamber group. So there's two string trios, there's three string quartets, there's a flute trio, there's a, a clarinet trio, 
There's a woodwind quartet of two oboes, two bassoons. There's a brass quartet of trumpet, French horn, alto, trombone, bass trombone. Dan and Jeff, you guys actually are what are called soloists. Um, tuba part generally is the bass clef part of the spark and vibe. And there will probably be some places where we may pull you in or out, Mike. Um, and you know, anything we ask you to do today, it's not because we think you suck. <laughs> because we decided we want to do it differently. Stuff that goes up way high in the piccolos, yeah, we just drop it down. We will drop it down. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of places where I put an APA, and uh, I'll just ask her even today to just yeah, uh, just just keep them down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Exactly. And um, what else? I already uh, also asked the basses to give more of a downbeat, mm -hmm. and but you know that's. I wasn't I wasn't aware how difficult it seems is this for classical players to actually play in time with oh, each other. It's <laughs> terrible. Yeah. This is something they kind of have to learn for this piece. Right. Just to have this one clock. Mm -hmm. like, a, like this pulse. Well I can help them by being more clicky the way I conduct too. So yeah. I won't conduct legato. I'll, I'll yeah, to just really clicky. Yeah. I think that's yeah. that's really important. Yeah. Um, so I take back what I said at the beginning about please play soft. What I'd like you to do is play normal. Because what's going on is nobody's playing rhythm. Because you're working too hard to stay soft. Uh, it's, it's a really difficult question because it comes from, from a really different part that it's not really me. You know, when I started as a young kid, to be interested in music, I was looking for ways to find a new 
new sound, something that is kind of a new combination of what we've already known, but you know, like a new combination that really generates a new sound. And um, so I've, I've been studying, um, you know, this this particular compositional technique that I've employed here for a long time, and I came up with all of it myself. And it basically what it does, and you can you can tell like what it does, it like completely um, ruptures <coughs> like the musical um, fabric and kind of distributes the individual tiny elements across the whole orchestra and it makes it so, 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 so hard to kind of, um, you know, hear the whole and understand the whole just coming from the perspective of that little particle and so really what, I try, what I'm trying to figure out still is what is required of the player, the performer, to kind of be in the right headspace to play this piece. And that's why I'm, I'm glad that you're here and that we have the opportunity to, to practice this together, play this together. <coughs> because that's, like, that's going to be like the most challenging and most important part for this piece to you know, become alive as a piece of music, is that each of us needs to have this headspace. <coughs> and you know, like, there, there are many ways how you could maybe, you know, I'm, I'm saying I still need to figure it out, but it's some kind of <coughs> meditative state, it's some kind of um, hypnotic state. And Thomas and I we were discussing that, and we started with the eighth movement, which is kind of really a bad idea in a way, because <coughs> obviously you, you don't know all the stuff that's already happened before, and we, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm going to uh, predict that once you hear the first movement now, and then we go to the second, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, it's going to make a little more sense, because we get into that mood that um, the piece and the string <coughs> of events generate. As we started proceeding through the piece, especially the final run through yesterday, it just sort of started taking on a life of its own. And as, a, as one of the musicians said, it's like, you know, the, the starship Toad Morton has, has taken off, you know, and it really did. And, and even as a conductor, it felt really good because, you know, it started out the rehearsal really having to work hard, really trying to pull things and everybody together and get it focused. And then as it slowly took on this life of its own, I was able to kind of back off, step away. That's a very, from my point of view as a conductor, that's a good thing. We went through the movements in reverse order, which was kind of a little mean, because people were starting to play in a place where they, uh, you know, didn't have any context. Um, so with that, that kind of, uh, worked anyway because then when we started to play from the front it just all fell into place and it was just amazing um, energy created and this forward movement and um, it was really really hard not to not to weep at the end of the piece Marcus is, is uh, very versatile for a, a rock. I know him as a rock player, and he can do the, the progressive rock stuff we do in uh, King Crimson style in, in Stickman. But uh, he has, he's, he's very versatile, and he has a training that allows him to, to really be what I consider a real composer. The rest of us can write pieces, but, and Marcus can do that and can write something on the simple side for me and, and Pat. And he also can compose, and, and this is a great example of some really, really heavy-duty composing. It's a great piece. It kind of, uh, it's got a lot of complex harmonies that kind of draw you in. You listen to it, and the longer, the longer you go into it, the more you realize you, you're kind of understanding the harmonies as you go along. You'll have to hear it to, to, to understand what I'm talking about, but it's really cool. And when I first heard of his idea to have orchestra do it, um, 
it seemed fascinating, like wonderful idea to, because that'll bring a whole lot of t- kind of tonal colors to it that, that didn't, weren't available the way he, did, he recorded it first. So it's an exciting idea. I think it's going to be an exciting performance. It's really everything about it's exciting. I'm very happy for Marcus and um, I'm, I admire him and his talent. I only just heard some of that, the orchestral version or, or the early one, a rehearsal, and wasn't su- it wasn't surprising in that it, there is all this, these tonal, these textures that you don't have with when you're doing a smaller recording. So it wasn't surprising, but it was wonderful. Uh, and I, I really only heard a little of it. Uh, again, more excitement and more interest in what's coming. And, and it's a great project. Um, I played a lot of orchestral stuff, and I never played anything where each each player had its own individual part. It's a fascinating, and to me, a really new way of doing things. And uh, wow, good luck to everybody involved. It's going to be very interesting and very special. I got here and it was um, like the next day we we already started. I mean, to to buy side we started you know writing to do lists and um, um, started communicating with people with pledges who were you know coming uh, to the show to the concert or to the recording session, and we did a whole lot of like most of the work in that first on that first day, which was the Sunday. Um, because um, we had like you know leading up to the performance we had three rehearsals the Monday Tuesday and Wednesday and it turned out that they, we re- they were really uh, very much needed for the process so we concentrated mostly concentrated on that I met Marcus in 2004 in Belgium where there was a summer school class for touch style uh, guitars and I drove there to meet him and study with him. And um, that's when he told me that he's moving to Austria, which is just a couple of hours from my place. And so I started taking lessons with him every couple of weeks and visited him for two days. And so we got talking about music and, you know, composition. And that was also the time when I started my music studies. So it was kind of natural development that we were, you know, talking a lot. Uh, listening to music together and then started working together. So should we go ahead and kind of try to decide if we want to do anything aside from just having this played softer? I think, I think it will be, I think we should just thin it out uh-huh. because the um, synchronization of the parts is it's just a little problematic. You well, know so, I mean? so if we wanted it to be, you know, to be more together, yeah. You know, we should we could do this like I was suggesting we could alternate between the two sides. Mhm. Mhm. Over those mm-hmm. eight measures or yes. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's easy. We'll just um just do the yeah. edits and yeah. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Code is 309. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So, um, what was the second vibe player actually reading? It's um, it's this lower line of the marimba part is where that is incorporated. To me, it skips skips a bit in stift. The, the boat vibes and the uh, mm-hmm. we were wondering if, if you just that. went to a softer mallet there um, you know it would be mm-hmm. uh, we should try that I think yeah okay so that's in the uh, um, first move that's measure 35 yeah oh that was the bass drum I think which or I'm, I'm actually not sure. It was just like it sounded really oh, that's the with, with a with a belly, as we would say <laughs> in German. 
it's <laughs> and um, it's kind of it's, it's, the, it's the, the timpani in 71 or the timpani yeah i think it was. when we started out he had this three part chord structure which was which was 513 measures long but that's that that's all there was basically and we started out tracking guitars and then you know sending adding a little bit of synths and sending those signals back out into our laptops and mangling that and adding electronics and I came back I think a month later and it was just very clear that um, it wasn't going to turn out like trepanation at all because by then we had developed further harmonic content out of this basic cell that he's using it was just really fascinating to see that this much complexity could come out of a very very simple initial cell of information because yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of places where people have 50 or 60 measures uh, without any playing. Of, of checking emails on <laughs> smartphones yeah <laughs> Um, mainly I'm going through the score and marking entrances uh, for musicians who have had many measures of rest and, uh, and it's just a way of ensuring that they come in in the right place and then secondarily because there's a lot of times that the musicians, some of the musicians have long periods of time when they're, you know, like 60, 70 measures of rest where they don't play, that I give them markers of other things that are happening in the piece just to kind of act as uh, road signs uh, for them. Yeah, the um, meeting that uh, Tobias, uh, Thomas and I had this afternoon was mostly about kind of going through our notes uh, about last night's um, rehearsal and there wasn't really that much we had to discuss but we made a couple of changes to the arrangement, well to the orchestration. Um, there are our little kind of bell sounds um, between movements that uh, were not in the original composition that I've added, added in for this version, and we've kind of uh, looked at, you know, like perfecting the placement of these little uh, cues, markers in the piece. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the second rehearsal. Um, because yesterday was the first rehearsal and second rehearsal means that some of the people will actually remember the first rehearsal and it's going to be a second rehearsal and it's going to be great. Yesterday there was a lot of snow and um, like one quarter of the orchestra wasn't able to show up. So I'm really looking forward to hopefully hearing the full ensemble, full orchestra play the piece tonight. This, this piece of music is, you know, I don't know if it's still a mystery to me, but something very special is required to be able to play it. You kind of really have to totally accept what it is. So I'm just, just looking forward to this process of everybody opening up to the challenge.
Bruce and and uh, Paul. You play measure 309. You guys are going to be past it, the two of you on 309. Then we're going to reverse that in 310. You guys play. You guys take that measure off. Tuesday night was, you know, instead of like a reading situation, it's where I really went in and honed in and cleaned stuff up, you know, got people to play with more confidence, uh, got them to understand what was happening in terms of, of the piece. And it was just a, a real, you know, thorough rehearsal, uh, really pretty detailed, um, and it was good. When I was working, walking down that, that hallway in that school where the first two rehearsals were this week, um, I had this feeling, I mean, these people, all these people are here because of me. And not, not necessarily for me or because of me as, like, who I am, but I'm kind of the, the catalyst for this happening. I'm the reason for this happening and I, it really put, put a put a smile on my face and at the same time I realized that it's kind of, you know, that things are getting out of my hand in a way. Dundo. However, movement <coughs> five not only um, you know will you see the samurai, but that's when the Glockenspiel starts playing. So. All right, so let's try uh, movement four.
Are these really high notes for him to well, play? Well, it's this one here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know, so it's maybe it will make sense. It's over a two octave drop. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think um, it will make jump. sense to take that down an octave? Because no, the no. first time around he really didn't play it and it's so exposed, you know? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, just a question for you. He played it just fine the second time around, towards mm -hmm. the end of the mm -hmm. rehearsal. Um, it's just a surprise factor for him. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that what they call chance operations? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, measure threes, uh, three, three, seven. Wednesday night's rehearsal was in the King Center Concert Hall, which is the venue for the performance, or, uh, so that we would have an opportunity to feel and hear what that sounds like. And yes, it was snowing like crazy again on Wednesday, especially up north. Um, in Fort Collins, they must have had a couple feet of snow. And unbelievably, uh, the French horn professor, um, uh, John McGuire from the university in Fort Collins. I mean, he made it down here, but he left like in the middle of the afternoon to be able to make it to rehearsal. We did have one pe person missing from the rehearsal who was coming from south of town where it was apparently really, really icy. It was a skating rink. And she said, slid off the road once and just turned around and went home. She was really freaked out. I was the only one giggling. They didn't used to only have to teach down here. You used to be able to get into this lot from over there. Happy spring. Come on in. Happy spring. Happy spring. Happy spring. Not a stick back. <laughs> shapes right exactly uh, but they are not only mirrored that way they also mirror that way like okay in, in, in pitch you know and the time and everything is everything is like a i don't like a kaleidoscope right right you know so what it's, you have here you have, have there okay and it's so it's constant modulation but the modulation happens on you know every single level of the music mm -hmm. <laughs> the search for power. since you're sitting in the orchestra. What's going on, guys? How are you feeling about tomorrow? Beautiful. Me too. Ready. Ready. Yes. Ready to roll. Should be gorgeous. I always have like a bit more of a radio face, though. You know? <laughs> With a radio face, you gotta love it. Came, came from a friend of mine, yeah. yeah so, uh, so why don't you tell me about your... Uh, um, experience playing this piece so far. And, uh, oh, well, I'm playing two pieces because I'm playing Gregory's piece too, okay. but um, the Toad and Morton 513 is a pretty cool piece. It's um, not something that is very technical for my, for, on my part, mm -hmm. but it's, it's really, it's a lot of concentration because you got a lot of rest. It's, I start off like a percussionist. I, I, first thing I do is rest for 64 bars. And then the other bass player comes in, and I still don't play for another like 24 bars. And then when I play, you know, it's I mean, you, you it's it's um, from a player's point of view, it's very meditative because you have to. It 
sort of like concentrating on your breathing when you're concentrating on your counting. You have to remember to breathe too, though. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. Today is Wednesday, and it's the last day before the premiere, and uh, it's a little, um, you know, it's very snowy outside again, and we're a little worried uh, if all the musicians can make it tonight, and especially, like, I mean, tomorrow night for the premiere, and they all need to be here, and um, I'm uh, a little concerned about that, but. Uh, but other than that, I'm kind of looking forward to hearing the piece played in its entirety, entirety tonight. And, um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really nice venue. It's really big. It looks like there are, I guess, maybe three, four, five hundred seats, maybe even. It's, it's big, and uh, I hope that we have uh, a lot of people in the audience. I hope there's going to be more people in the audience than on stage. <laughs> The dress rehearsal is the day before the concert, so I don't want to do what I did on Tuesday night, which is really work people. I just want to do a run through. And there was, aside from that, good reason for Wednesday night was that we moved into the hall. And that changed everything because the, the band room, as nice as a gift as it was from Shell Stanfield, it was really dry acoustics in there. And so it didn't blend and mold um, the sound the way that the concert hall at the King Center did. And that's when I think I could just kind of see the, the, the lights going on for a lot of the musicians. You know, it's like, oh, wow, this piece really is cool. And I can hear these really slow moving melodies. And so it was really beneficial, I think, to the, to the psyche of the orchestra and the piece to have that experience then. It was a good dress rehearsal. I mean, I was really proud of the musicians all, you know, really made an effort to be there, so.
cat grab you and don't uh, hang out for a bit. Yeah, do you have a big do you have a big pack with you or is it just carry on stuff? No, oh, awesome. Let's see, figure out how far we are from the airport and stall it. But okay, we'll see you in a little bit. I'll uh, I'll give you a call here once we get into the building because this is you know parking lot looks pretty huge. If you can, if that's the easiest, yeah, that would be great. Then I'll give us a goal to add to. Uh, all right, thanks, bud. All right, bye bye. Level two seems legit. Well, we we're at uh, Denver International Airport uh, waiting to pick up Pat. We just picked up Adrian. Um, so it's just been uh, kind of chill. Method Man just walked by, so I didn't know that, um, but I was told. And uh, it's just been fairly nice. I think we'll beat the traffic and uh, get everybody downtown and end up having a nice evening. So. How are you doing? Planet of Back Clean 5. Hi. Level 5. There is no level 5. Oh, good to see you again. Hey. Good to see you with your crazy hair, dude. <laughs> hey, nice shirt. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hey, it's good to see you. Okay, let's get out of here. Okay, yeah, we're not let's actually park very there. far, so, well, relatively. Yeah. Oh, so. Yeah. Good uh, miss for the world. Yeah, yeah that's the way we felt. Not enough action down there to film. You had to come down here. <laughs> well, that's the man that's walked by. So we didn't. Uh, breaking it up, you know, this is breaking up the... Last time you talked to me, but I didn't fall on your face. Oh, yeah. I flew in from Austin, Texas yesterday. Um, and I'm here to support Marcus, to uh, uh, get to see this and hear it and um, and give him some moral support, you know. Um, a lot of work went into this thing. It'd be, and I was surprised, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of homeboys there last night, actually. They flew in from all over, so uh, he had the support he needed. Yeah, yeah. And they got a great thing here. Thomas and everybody involved put in a really a lot of work. And, you know, two can play that game. <laughs> as soon as I get my shit together. I got a big gun and you got <laughs> Show off. There ain't no background checks gonna be preventing me. <laughs> Look at the snow. Boy, it melted fast. Strapped. Well, it's... Pretending. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just... They, they said it would save me. Four to seven but it might save me for getting a ticket. But this so, is familiar. This is how you ride in uh, on stickman tours, huh? On every on every is. tour, your whole life. This is <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're not you're not flying on private jets with Tony with Peter Gabriel. Huh? Yeah, I'm not never been invited on that jet. <laughs> you weren't even invited on the tour bus. Even when we had the private jets, they weren't that big. like a Colorado spring day, <laughs> finally. <laughs> nice. Well, we're getting, uh, we're uh, just on our way down to the concert hall for the concert. We get in there plenty early just to make sure the setup and logistics and stuff are going okay. And the week went, especially given that we are dealing with this weather problem in April in Colorado, which was pretty abnormal. We, uh, we did well. I mean, I feel I feel very prepared for the concert. I feel the orchestra's prepared for it. It was, uh, it was funny last night. Nikki was, you know, she's sitting next to a couple of trombone players, and and they're they're veteran, you know, freelance and symphony members and stuff, and college professors. And as a lot of freelance classical musicians are, you know, you're you're kind of skeptical and maybe just a little on the grumpy side. Um, a lot of the time, at least in your, you know, kind of the outer shell. And she said last night after we got done reading through Todd Morton in the uh, in the dress rehearsal, the guys kind of turned to each other and went, yeah, I like it. <laughs> it 
which is uh, that's as much of a vote of confidence as uh, you could ask for, really, because uh, you know they're they're good musicians. They they are able to perceive a lot of things, and uh, they've thought about whether you know it's something worthwhile or not. Mm -hmm. You know the weather today finally is good, <laughs> so so shouldn't be any problems getting to the hall. We shouldn't be missing anybody in the orchestra. I mean that was kind of the worst aspect of the whole the whole thing with the weather this week was that we were just missing people here and there on rehearsals. But I have to really hand it to the majority of the orchestra. Really, you know, busted their butts to drive through all the snow and ice to get to rehearsals, which. It's scary for me as a leader. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been on the other side when I've just kind of thrown my hands up at a certain point when I've been trying to get to a gig and go, you know what, I don't feel like risking my life right now for this. Mm -hmm. A lot of 20th century or avant-garde pieces, 21st century pieces, as a conductor, um, your role, probably more so than, than in more traditional repertoire, really is that you need to be a traffic cop and make sure that people know where they are, you know, help them make their entrances. Um, you know, the hardest thing for me last night, for some reason, the dress rehearsal is that each sub, there are eight subsections in the piece. And at the beginning of each subsection, I've promised the orchestra that I will give what I call a samurai downbeat, which is, you know, both hands with the baton down, kind of an unusual gesture, but I found it's useful as a marker. Uh, kind of situation and I've marked it in the score with big red marks and you know I know where the end of the movements are it's not like I'm lost or something but last night I just about every single one of them I forgot to give the samurai we have a lot of different worlds um, coming together or colliding um, here uh, in the best possible way and so I think for for Marcus and Tobias it was a little bit of a learning experience to understand how you handle an orchestra versus handling any kind of a small group. Um, you know, the dynamics are really different. And, and it is a big reason we were discussing, you know, why I became a conductor. And really the biggest reason I became a conductor wasn't because I thought, you know, I'm gonna be the next Leonard Bernstein or Herbert von Karajan or, you know, one of these big name guys and I'm gonna conduct the Berlin Phil or something. That was never my goal. I just reached the point as a player myself where it was like, there's got to be a way to do this that's respectful so that people want to do their best. Because if you have, like tonight, a group of 50 people, you know, there's, there's going to be like five people on stage that just had a bad day today. You know, that's it's just a given. Um, there's probably, you know... I'm, I'm going to, you know, guess on the low side and say there's probably 10 people in the orchestra that basically aren't really all that fond of me. <laughs> um, so, so you know, how do you, you know, it, it's, it's not like you're with a trio or a quartet of your buddies where it's like, yeah, you know, we're really into it. We're really cool. We're really connected. Um, you can't establish that same kind of bond in the same way with, you know, 50 pieces or 75 pieces. So, Nikki, where are we at now and how, uh, how are you feeling about what's going on right now? Oh, pretty close to panic mode here. <laughs> it's only about a year's worth of work, you know, you so, go. yeah, pretty exciting. So, at least the weather cleared, so I'm hoping it's a good omen for, um, you know, audience turnout. I think we got some pretty good publicity out on the local classical radio station, so. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're hoping. Sounds good. Yeah, right. yeah. On to business. Yep. I'm very relaxed, happy. Looking forward to what it's going to sound like with people in, in the hall, you know. It's going to make a difference. So we're going to get more audience members than, than, uh, than orchestra members? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> what was that experience like working with this particular piece? Uh, it was unlike anything I've ever experienced. Um, it's interesting to have an entire arrangement coming from one place and then have a different arrangement, but that is in harmony with the other one coming from a completely different section and having several of those uh, all around the room. It's, it's something that I've never... 
I've never needed to try and capture before, and, and uh, it was a very educational process. Cool. Having, having multiple groups sitting beside each other and trying to capture the energy and the melody and harmonies from each group individually, but that still sounds like they're all together. And that's uh, that's a, that's something that I've that's, that I've never come close to having to do before. It was a, 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 it, it's 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 incredible. The melodic structure is is unlike anything I've ever heard before. It leaves it leaves a lot more to the to the listener than I think I've ever experienced. You can focus on any one area and satisfy your whole palate, but then if you just expand your listening, there's a flood of more information that, that is, it's, it, I, I don't even, I don't have no, I have no idea how to describe it. <laughs> yeah. So how are we feeling right now? I'm very happy. I'm very happy that it's going to happen. It's completely out of my hands and I'm just uh, looking forward to it. Very much. Yeah, I feel very, very relaxed inside. Very, very happy that it's happening. And looking, looking forward to how my response to the piece changes with other people in the room. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. It was just so well played, um, and the the emotional waves kind of you know pushing towards the end and like um, silence after the piece. Fantastic. Just fantastic. Just the way I thought it would be. <laughs> Fortunately.
See you Saturday. Yeah, see you Saturday. Aufnahme machen wir mal. Eine richtige Aufnahme. Und dann auch alle Leute wieder zusammen? Ja. Ich dachte, ihr hättet das jetzt hier auch zusammen? Nein, nee, nee, das war nicht so. Das war nur für Privaten. Wow, um, that was moving. It was really fabulous. Um, I don't know what to say about it. Um, the way that they had split the orchestra up was really cool sounding in this room. That really blew me away because usually you hear things in certain sections of the orchestra and it was really spread around. But I'm really happy for Marcus and great night. Really fun to be here. <laughs> yep. I don't think I've ever seen a more complicated arrangement put together so expertly and played by so many simultaneously. I can imagine what a challenge that was for the conductor and what a joy it must be for Marcus to be able to, to be enjoying this right now. What a monumental occasion. Congratulations. Um, it was very intense and you couldn't fall asleep. It was pretty great. I can only relate to it as if I was in the middle of a crisis. It's kind of what it feels like, a prolonged crisis or some kind of natural disaster or something. That's what it kind of felt like. Very so, intense. It, it was amazing. I feel fabulous after listening to it. Um, I was just telling my friend that I'm a writer, so I process things a little bit differently than a musician. And as I was listening, I began to notice a pattern that very much reminded me of the hero's journey um, that shows up so often in narrative. And it, once I hooked into that, it satisfied my expectation entirely with the way it ended and with the way everything blended together. It was, it was amazing. So the narrative I kind of heard with it was, yes. it's the story of a life. Yeah. You begin with, at the very beginning, you build up to that first big climactic point where you think that you've just been mowed over by life. And then the next piece is recovery and still struggle and struggle and struggle. And then probably two thirds of the way through, it sounded like there had been an epiphany and suddenly um, things changed and blended in a different way. And that built up to the one big test at the end, which felt like, if I were the person going through it, you managed it successfully. So, so uh, post-premiere thoughts. <laughs> what? Get that camera out of your face. Where is my beer? <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uh, it really went well. It was really cool. Um, you know, it, it definitely, it definitely had even new things that came out in the performance tonight that hadn't been present in the rehearsals. And and, uh, and uh, I, I think, I think what was really impressive. I mean, so much was, but what was really impressive was at the end. We were just talking about how, you know, you feel like you're there, and there's a couple more bumps before we really are there. And to be able to keep that intensity going, I mean, not only is it in the piece, but it was in the playing tonight, too. You know, uh, really, my hats are off to Bruce Berry, our principal trumpet player, because he, um, he, he, took, the, he took the horse and he rode it. <laughs> so, How'd you so. do with the samurai sword? I uh, didn't miss a single one. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a rehearsal's for. There you go. <laughs> The performance was just, from the very beginning, um, uh, I was kind of totally engaged and I was a little, you know, the, the little worry that was left was that maybe, you know, is, are there going to be sections that are boring to me, you know? And um, no, it was all great and um, just the, the, the tension was, you know, kept throughout the whole performance and um, there were like wonderful ebbs and flows of, of timbre. Uh, changes and uh, dynamics and um, and it builds so beautifully at the end into a, this amazing crescendo climax um, and once the last chord you know like kind of was cut off um, there was like a like a reverb in the room like a couple seconds of rever reverberation and a total total silence for, I don't know, 10 seconds or something. And, uh, you know, 
I was totally breathless and um, it liter literally had taken my breath away and um, so the um, it was almost like 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 I couldn't I really couldn't breathe and it, but it felt like it also was the same for the people in the room because of the silence and then um, finally you know people started clapping and uh, relaxing and um, it was just really wonderful.